Hello, I'm Elizabeth Shepherd. I'm speaking to you from London today and thank you for asking me to join this session. We've put together a short presentation on trimethylaminuria and a summary of the content is shown on this slide. So I'll tell you a little bit about the protein FMO3, about trimethylamine, about how information flows in the cell, a bit about the FMO3 gene and what is it when FMO3 doesn't work. In other words, what causes the protein not to work? I'll tell you a little bit about nomenclature and give you some examples, a bit about diagnostics and how we read the gene, and importantly, how do we know that a change in DNA truly changes FMO3 activity and is causative of trimethylaminuria? And then I'll end with a short uh, account of some of the prospects uh, for therapy. Flavin containing monooxygenase 3 or FMO3. So why the name? The protein can't act on its own. It has to bind to a small molecule called FAD, which is the flavin part. And that's why we call it flavin containing. The monooxygenase part of the name comes from the fact that the protein adds one atom of oxygen to the chemicals that are substrates for it. So one atom of oxygen from molecular oxygen, which has two atoms of oxygen, and therefore monooxygenase. And why the number FMO3? Well, it's simply because this is the third FMO protein that scientists identified. And humans also have FMO1, FMO2, FMO4, and FMO5. But only FMO3 is involved in trimethylaminuria. And why does the problem arise? Well, when we eat, uh, a number of food products have chemicals like choline in them, and they have a particular structure. And they all contain a nitrogen, that's the N here, and these uh, three groups where you see CH3, that's carbon, and three hydrogens, and that's known as a methyl group. And you can see a nitrogen and three methyl groups. And what the bacteria in the gut do is they break a bond between the nitrogen and the carbon to the left of the nitrogen in this slide. And it liberates a small molecule called trimethylamine, which has a nitrogen and these three methyl groups, and therefore trimethylamine. Trimethylamine is then transported in the blood and in the liver. The enzyme FMO3 will add an oxygen to the nitrogen. And so we have this chemical now called trimethylamine N oxide. And the difference between trimethylamine and trimethylamine N oxide, apart from the fact that one has an oxygen on the nitrogen, is that trimethylamine has a strong odor and trimethylamine N oxide does not. The initial diagnosis for most people with the disorder would be a urine analysis. And what this simply does is it measures the concentrations of trimethylamine and trimethylamine N oxide in the urine. And then the results are usually expressed as a percentage. And what this percentage is, is that the amount of trimethylamine N oxide is divided by the amount of trimethylamine plus the amount of trimethylamine N oxide times 100. So this gives you a percentage of the tri total trimethylamine and oxide as a percentage of trimethylamine plus trimethylamine and oxide. And in uninfected individuals, the value will be about 90 to 100 percent. For mild tr trimethylaminuria, it will be about 70 to 90 percent, and in severe cases, less than 70 percent. Now the initial diagnosis um, is a urine, was a urine test and most people probably would start with a urine test. But the ability to uh, clone DNA, sequence DNA, enabled us to establish that trimethylaminuria is a genetic disorder. And the way that information flows in the cell is that it goes from DNA to RNA to protein. Now DNA, as most of you will know, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And this is the molecule that carries the genetic information, the blueprint of the cell. 
and this information is transferred to an intermediate molecule called RNA ribonucleic acid and then the information from RNA is used to make protein and mistakes in DNA lead to mistakes in proteins and the mistake or the severity of the mistake depends on a number of things but if the mistake is severe then the protein activity will be compromised and some mistakes are just mis little mistakes and they don't matter at all. Now the four building blocks of DNA are A, T, C and G. These are the bases. The actual building blocks are called nucleotides and these are a little bit more complicated but you can simply think of them as A, T, C and G. And A equals adenine, T equals thymine, C equals cytosine and G equals guanine. And so when we read a sequence of DNA we always just read it as A, T, C's and G's. Now for some reason in organisms like humans uh, evolution has made our genes quite complex. And our genes are really quite long, much longer than they need to be to make the RNA molecule that ultimately will be used to make the protein. And our genes are split. This means that they have different sections to them um, and these sections are called exons and introns. And this whole long gene comprising the exons and introns is copied into an RNA molecule, into one long RNA molecule that has all the information from the exons and the introns. And this process is called transcription. That is the copying of DNA into RNA. And then something extraordinary happens. The introns get removed from this long RNA by a process called processing. And the exons get joined together to form a shorter RNA. And it's this RNA molecule that is then used to make a protein. And the use of the RNA to make a protein, we call it translation. The FMO3 gene has nine exons and the RNA codes for 532 amino acids. Now, in this picture here, you see that some of the blocks are pink and some are blue, and these just represent the number of the exons that code for that particular part of the protein. So, two means that exon 2, the RNA sequence derived from exon 2 is coding for that part of the protein and then 3, 4 and so on. You'll notice that we have the small molecule FAD, the flavin, it's bound very close to one end of the protein and then there's another small molecule called NADPH which also has to be bound to FMO3. So for the protein to function properly it has to be attached to these two small molecules, FAD and NADPH. So what types of changes, mutations, that is changes in the DNA, can cause the FMO3 protein to malfunction? Well, changes that prevent the FAD group binding to the protein will cause the protein to malfunction because they won't have the flavin attached. Changes that prevent the NADPH group from binding to the protein will also not allow the protein to carry out its job properly. Some changes cause a protein to be made that is too short. So protein synthesis will start, but the mutation will cause protein synthesis to stop. And so all of the information that is needed to make the protein is not present and therefore the protein that you make is too short to do its job. Proteins have to adopt a precise three-dimensional shape for them to be active. And a change in the protein that creates the wrong shape will also cause the protein not to be active. And some changes actually put the protein in the wrong place in the cell. So the protein is made, it's the right length, it just doesn't know where to go in the cell. And that's because 
The sequence of amino acids of a protein creates little address labels that send the protein to the right place in the cell. And if this is changed, the protein doesn't know where to go and it can't carry out its function. So it's a bit like putting a letter in a letter box without an address. It will go to the post office sorting box, but it can't go anywhere else. It can't arrive at the destination that you intended. So nomenclature. I'm showing you a, an example here in case you've read some of the literature so you can understand what this nomenclature means. The international organizations are trying to standardize this nomenclature. We haven't quite got there yet, but we're well on our way to doing this. So when we look at these changes, we talk about things like 94G2A. So what does this mean? This simply means that the G at position 94 in the RNA molecule, that is the 94th base, has changed to an A. So a G to an A at position 94. In this case, the 94th base happens to be an exon 2, and it changes an amino acid, which we say E32 to K. What does this mean? It means that the amino acid at position 32 in the protein has changed from a glutamate, which in shorthand notation is an E, to lysine, which in shorthand notation is a K. So E32K means that amino acid 32 has changed from a glut glutamate to a lysine. So here are some examples of mutations that cause trimethylaminuria. There are more than this, I'm just showing you some of them. Now I mentioned there were different things that can go wrong with the protein, so that the NADPH might not bind or the FAD might not bind. Those are actually quite tricky to identify. You can identify the mutation, but then saying, well, is it the FAD that doesn't bind or the NADPH that doesn't bind, that's a little bit scientifically more, more tricky. But for the two uh, changes that I've shown in purple here, we know what's happened to the protein. So G148X means that protein synthesis started, but it stopped too early. And we ended up with a protein of 148 amino acids instead of 532. So obviously the protein could not do its job. And E314X means that the protein again is too short, but this time protein synthesis stopped at amino acid 314, not at 532 as it would to make the f what we call the full length FMO3 protein. This is an example of the first mutation um, that was shown to cause trimethylaminuria. So the first time that was established that this is a genetic disorder. And in this case, we found a change at position 458 where a C changed to a T. And this changed an amino acid at position 153 from a proline to a leucine. So let me just explain what this picture means. So here we actually have a little portion of the DNA sequence of a patient, a father, and someone who does not have trimethylaminuria. And I should add that the father does not have trimethylaminuria and does not present with those symptoms, only the child. So we can analyze DNA and in each of these little pictures, um, each of the black bands actually represents a G, an A, a T or a C. So if I just read the patient's DNA for you, starting from the bottom, we start, we have um, three T's, T, 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 then we have C, C, T, G, A, G, A, 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 C, C, A, T, C, C, A, A, T, oh sorry, C, T, C, T, A, T, G, 
T, G, and then a T. And the part that, if you look at each of the three uh, DNA sequences from the patient, the father, and the person who doesn't have trimethylaminuria, well, they look very similar, except for one position that is boxed. And in the patient, we have the sequence C, T, C. In the father, we have C, and then we have a band both in the T and in the C. And then we have a C. Now, the fact that we've got a band in both the T and the C tracks means that what we're looking at here is the two chromosomes of the father. And on the one chromosome, he has a C at that position, and on the other chromosome, he has a T at that position. So one of his genes will have the code CCC, and his other gene will have the code CTC. If we look at the person who does not have trimethylaminuria, we'll see that their code is CCC. This then makes one suspect that the code CTC is the problem, and the child has inherited the CTC gene from their father and also their mother, although their mother is not shown here. So the father is a carrier for the disorder. He has one normal gene, CCC, and one gene that could potentially cause trimethylaminuria if the child inherits two copies of CTC. Now CCC codes for the amino acid proline and CTC for leucine. So you can find this change in DNA, but how do you actually know that it causes trimethylaminuria? Because we all have lots of changes in our DNA. And so you have to do an experiment that's shown here. We take the RNA from a patient, or we create it artificially in the laboratory, and we create the mutation, and then we make protein from that RNA, and we test to see whether the protein that we have made can carry out the reaction of converting trimethylamine to trimethylamine N oxide. If it can, then that change does not cause tr trimethylaminuria. But if the protein can't do its job, then you know that that change is a change that causes trimethylaminuria. So what we have here is we're looking at what we call enzyme activity over time. In the enzyme, in orange, there's a proline at 153. This is when the sequence is CCC. That's, that's the sequence that was found in the person that did not have trimethylaminuria. And you can see that the slope of the graph indicates that the enzyme has very good activity. It can convert to trimethylamine to trimethylamine N oxide. However, when we test the mutant CTC sequence and the protein that comes from that sequence, you can see there's no activity at all. The line is just simply straight, it doesn't rise at all. So that tells us that actually that change of CCC to CTC is a mutation that causes trimethylaminuria and that changing a proline at 153 to the amino acid leucine at 153 does cause trimethylaminuria. And you have to be a little bit careful when you read the literature because people sometimes say this is a mutation that causes trimethylaminuria, but they haven't necessarily tested and proved that it has. Now there's an additional story to trimethylaminuria. Now we have common mutations in the FMO3 gene, so all of us have these changes. And these common mutations in DNA are known as SNPs, we pronounce that SNPs, and SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, which simply means a change in a single base. If we look at this table, and we look at E158K, this means that a glutamic acid at 158 can change into a lysine at 158. 
and the frequency in the population of this is about 45%. This means that 55% of people have an E at 158 and 45% of people have a K at 158. So half of you in the room will have an E and about half of you will have a K and that's just in the normal population. This is not a change that causes trimethylaminuria. It's just a very common change and its effect on FMO3 activity is very little. Then there's another change that occurs in some people at the amino acid 308 where the uh, amino acid glutamic acid changes to glycine and about 80% of people have an E or glutamic acid at 308 and 20% have a glycine at 308 and again there's very little change in FMO3 activity but there are situations where these common changes can cause a problem and can lead to a form of trimethylaminuria. And this is when, if two of the SNPs occur on the same FMO3 gene, then the protein is less active. So if we just look at 158K, which I said 45% of people have, that's perfectly fine. It's active. 20% of people have 308G on their gene, their protein is active. The problem comes if they've inherited the 158K and the 308G on the same gene. And that, when that DNA is made into RNA and then made into protein, that protein has a reduced activity. So in other words, the one change is tolerated, 158K, and the 308G alone is tolerated, but when you put the two together, this obviously has some fundamental effect on the protein, probably in changing its shape so that it cannot do its job properly. Now because 158K and 308G, if they occur on the same piece of DNA, on the same gene, we say that they occur in cis, on the same piece of DNA. Now I'm sure what you all would like to hear is that, you know, there is a, a therapy. But treating genetic disorders is not easy and people are trying to find cures for these types of disorders. And there are lots of genetic disorders and they all can be created by the factors that I've told you. The protein can be the wrong shape, can go to the wrong place in the cell. So what about a protein that is the wrong shape? Well, this is not specific to FMO3 or trimethylaminuria, but people are trying uh, for other genetic disorders to see if they can find drugs that will assist the protein to refold into the correct three-dimensional shape. Now this is quite a big ask of the protein that for it to kind of fold and unfold and then reform its sh correct shape. It would be fantastic if this happened. Now people have had some success when they've treated cells in culture that make it the mutant protein they add the drug and the protein can refold and regain some activity. But this is much more difficult uh, for an treat in vivo treatment, in other words for treatment of a patient. You can imagine you're taking a tablet and you've got to target one specific protein that's not folded correctly. It might come to fruition um, in some years and as I said people are trying to do this. What about a protein that is too short, where protein synthesis stops before it should? Well, there are better prospects here. And quite a lot of work is going on into this type of therapy. And that's because some forms of cystic fibrosis, lots of people, there are a lot of uh, people, 1 in 20 people are carriers for this disorder in uh, the Caucasian population, and some lysosomal storage diseases. So can we stop the protein synthesis from stopping and can we therefore make the protein longer and the basis of this therapy is that if we want to extend the length of the protein if we consider the RNA RNA has start and stop signals for protein synthesis and this little grey blob here is something we call the ribosome and it's sort of a complex machinery that helps to read the RNA code and in doing so a protein is synthesized so in the top 
section panel here, we have a mutant messenger RNA. Ribosome is at the start, moves along, and it hits its stop signal. So for example, the mutation 314X, where there's a stop signal, and only a short protein is made of 314 amino acids. So some drugs are being developed that interfere with the stop and let the ribosome machinery move past the stop and onto the normal stop. So in this case, in the ideal world, we would have a, a drug that would allow the ribosome to move along, gets to 314, kind of skips over that and then moves on to 532 and in the process makes a protein of 532 amino acids. Now, that's a very simple portrayal of this kind of therapy, but it's looking quite promising. Whether it will ever be used for treatment of trimethylaminurea? Well, trimethylaminurea is not a life-threatening disorder and it might be very hard for to get ethical approval or to go into clinical trials for that type of therapy. But one never knows. Um, if it becomes an accepted therapy and works really well for other disorders, then perhaps it would be translated to a whole repertoire of um, rare diseases like uh, trimethylaminuria. Now, if you can't fix the protein inside the body once it's made, well, what can you do? So, really the most attractive proposition is, well, it's the gut flora that caused the problem. So, can we do something about them? And some bacteria do produce more trimethylamine from foodstuffs such as choline than others do. And so the question is then, can the gut flora be manipulated to reduce the production of trimethylamine? And that's really very attractive because it's going to only target the gut flora. It's not like taking a drug that will affect every part of the body. You simply would be attacking the gut flora. And so in our laboratory, we are just about to begin a pilot project to determine if the gut flora are different when FMO3 is not active. And the ultimate aim would be to um, have gut bacteria that can't cleave off trimethylamine. And if you can't cleave off trimethylamine, well then the problem would simply disappear. Now I'm sure it's very frustrating you're all sitting there and I'm talking about looking at whether the gut flora are different when FMO3 is not active. But as a scientist, we have to move step by step. So if I wish to uh, attract research funding, I first have to have prelim preliminary data, and I must first have evidence that the gut flora are different in the presence of FMO3. And then step by step, you slowly build up until you can convince the funding bodies that, yes, you do have a good idea that really could be used um, as a treatment for trimethylamine urea. Now, actually there's a lot of evidence coming about now that um, gut flora are really important, not just uh, for trimethylamine urea, but actually for conditions like diabetes. And there's one experiment where they've changed the uh, actual gut flora from a thin to a fat person and actually the fat person has become thin. So there's a lot, these little bacteria that populate our guts um, are really very important to us. And if we can get a handle on what types of bacteria are there, then perhaps we can in the future manipulate them. And I would hope that perhaps in a couple of years, or in a couple, that's only two, but in a few years, maybe we would have better um, information for you and and a prospect that that can really help you now I have we haven't concentrated on the symptoms of trimethylamine urea because you are you are the experts we aren't we're just scientists who work on this particular disorder but if you want to uh, read a little bit more about trimethylamine urea 
the NCBI um, have a site called uh, Gene Reviews. Um, if you use this URL, you can go in there and just simply type in trimethylaminuria. We've just updated uh, this article. Uh, I'm not sure if the 2011 update has been posted yet, but if not, it should be available soon. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you from myself and from Ian Phillips. And uh, I wish you all well, and I hope you have a very good meeting today.